looking at was beta minus decay. Uh, if you remember rightly, the beta minus decay is uh, uh, we have an electron being ejected by this large nucleus. This large nucleus is unstable. It wants a neutron to turn into a proton, so it's changing its atomic number as well. Hang on, neutron is changing into a proton. Yeah, so it's now a new element. It ejects this negative charge, uh, this, this electron, uh, in order to lose the negative charge. Yeah, so um, we call this a beta particle, beta minus particle. Of course, we know that here's an example here. We've got carbon-14 turning into nitrogen-14. Uh, notice the mass numbers remain the same. The atomic numbers change, of course. We have the ejection of an electron here, beta minus particle, uh, gamma ray photon. We'll have to look at up the insignia for that shortly. And uh, this one here, of course, is what? Antineutrino, okay, with a little bar on the top is an antineutrino. Has a rest mass of zero, a charge of zero. And you would do this also, in some cases, they put the zero, zero for the gamma ray photon also. Um, then we looked at uh, what neutrinos were. Neutrinos are, of course, um, <clears throat> uh, show evidence of the existence of what. Why did why did why did Enrico Fermi predict this neutrino? Conservation of momentum. Thank you. Yes. So conservation of momentum said. Uh, the electron was going in one direction, and the um, the the um, parent nucleus or the daughter nucleus was going in a uh, in not exactly the opposite direction to the electron. And so there was something else being thrown off there in order to conserve um, in order to uh, that the conservation of momentum holds. Uh, Enrico Fermi predicted this. They didn't find them until I think it was the 1980s. Uh, we talked about that yesterday, though. Beta plus decay, we have a positron. It's the antiparticle of the electron. It's positively charged, has the same mass, uh, positively charged, but it's plus 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Uh, antiparticle, okay. So what we have here is we have a, a proton turning into a neutron and this nucleus ejecting some positive charge in order to do that. Here we have an example, nitrogen-13 turning into carbon-13. Notice here the, the um, neutron, uh, sorry, the proton is turning into a neutron. And so we're having a, an atomic number reduction here. Positron, gamma-ray photon, of course, and the neutrino here. Why do we see the gamma-ray photon? Can anybody remember? What? what how, how is this gamma ray photon? Gamma rays are, uh, these are very high energy photons, aren't they? In the order of millions of electron volts. Remember that the daughter nucleus is created in, a, in an excited state. Most often is the case. Uh, excited states for nuclei are in the order of millions of electron volts. And so in order to drop back down to a her ground state or its ground state, it loses millions of electron volts of energy. Uh, that energy is, is uh, thrown away or, or uh, got rid of in the form of this gamma ray photon. Um, uh, okay, and that's what that says there. Okay, next page. We got to the properties of radioactive emissions. Uh, this is an alpha particle here. I better get the right pen. Alpha particle. This is a beta particle, and this is a beta particle. Beta minus or beta plus. Um, large mass, large ionising ability for the alpha particle. Of course, it's going to interact with the most matter. The beta minus and the beta plus particles, small mass, uh, small ionising ability, uh, is not going to interact as much with as much matter. Of course, it's still nasty. Why is that? Can you remember why that is? It travels further. And so it's got a better chance. It comes into, into range, into the range of, of more particles or molecules or compounds or polymers. Gamma ray photons, uh, very low ionizing ability, but would pass straight through you. Uh, they, uh, they move at the speed of light, of course. It is light. 
and uh, and they have a low ionizing ability, but they would come into contact or they would they would come very close to uh, lots and lots of molecules in uh, organic matter. Thereby, there's the chance that this this any one of these radiations is going to change uh, the chemistry of that organic matter. If it does it uh, in the DNA of that matter, um, it doesn't matter so much if it damages the cells, um, as long as it doesn't ma damage too many cells, of course. If it damages the cell, the cell dies, the organism lives on. If it damages the DNA in the cell, um, one of two things, or one of two things that I know that can happen, one is that the cell uh, doesn't function properly, proteins aren't created properly, the cell dies, uh, nobody's any the wiser. Uh, the cell also, the DNA can be damaged in such a way that um, it causes the nucleus or the, the cell itself to reproduce uncontrollably and that's when we see cancer occurring. Cancer is just your own cells, they're just out of control. Hopefully nobody gets that nasty stuff. Alpha particles, um, they'll travel a few centimetres in air, but they're stopped by paper. Now, I said to the other class, and I forgot about this yesterday, <clears throat> and that is that uh, we did an experiment and we were still seeing these things through a sheet of paper. So I think um, what they mean to say in the textbook is they can be stopped by a sheet of paper, not that they will be stopped by a sheet of paper. All right? Beta particles, 100 times the penetrating ability of alpha particles, so they won't be stopped by a sheet of it, uh, a sheet of paper. Um, they can be, I'll say. They can be stopped. By, I think it's 10 millimetres of aluminium. One centimetre. Did I write this down somewhere? Hang on. Sorry, I'll just get this right because I got a number wrong earlier and somebody picked on me. Uh, penetration. Uh, one millimetre. Stop by one millimetre thick. Aluminium. Gamma ray photons. Now let's let's have a look at this uh, insignia. Gamma. Oh, that, that's okay, isn't it? What's wrong with mine? It, it's the lowercase gamma. That's obviously the uppercase there. Um, Right, I, I, I'm probably focusing on the little kick here and then drawing a Y is what I'm doing. And I, uh, that's what my lecture at university did. It's hard for me to change because it, it's not a particular thing to uh, imagine now all of a sudden all of your letter A's had to be something else. How would you go writing? Not, not so well. Thank you for that anyway. Yes, maybe I shouldn't put this little kick here, but I'm going to leave it there. Gamma. Um, how far do you think they travel? Yeah, indefinitely. Travel at 3 by 10 to the 8 metres per second. They are light. And indefinitely. Now, what I mean by indefinitely is we're not exactly sure what it is that will stop them. Um, they, they don't travel through air forever. In fact, you know that we're not being bombarded with gamma ray photons right now. For what reason? Because of our atmosphere. So they do get stopped by stuff, which means if they get stopped by stuff, they interact with stuff, which means they have some ionising ability and can damage cells. Uh, travel at 3 by 10 to the 8 metres per second and indefinitely um, will, or no, the book says will, will say can be stopped by what's that Matthew 20 centimeters of lead or meters I'll say meters it's non nondescript of concrete 
uh, I believe uh, nuclear reactors are, or the the contain the, ca the containment vessel is is lead lined and then has about 10 meters of concrete on the outside. We'll talk about that in the next topic. Uh, so I'll have to remind myself of the numbers. Um, okay. Let's have a look at motion in magnetic fields. Who remembers motion of charged particles in magnetic fields? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. So we've got we've got a, a a circular motion, don't we? And I'm gonna I'm just gonna take a picture out of the book because that's the easiest thing for me to do. Uh, all the, oh, actually, what I'll do? No, yes, I'm not gonna take a picture out of the book. This is what I'll do. I'm gonna draw it, and this is my magnetic field into the board. I'm going to draw a particle in a second. And I'm going to draw it, well, I'll rather, I'll draw a path of a particle through this magnetic field. You can tell me what it is, what you think it is. Uh, I'll do it in green. Draw a straight line first because it, it doesn't, doesn't deviate without the presence of the magnetic field, but once it enters that magnetic field, it goes circular. What is it? What could it be? <laughs> Has to be a charged particle, doesn't it? What, by what formula would you say if they asked you the question, okay, uh, explain the path of this particle and why you know that it's a charged particle, you would have to, you could use a formula, what would you use? The right formula, yes. Oh. If it, it, it feels a force, doesn't it? It feels a force towards, it, towards the centre of some circle equals Q, V, B. Sine theta, remember this one? Um, so it's dependent upon charge, yes. It's dependent upon the velocity of that particle and it's dependent upon the magnetic field. I'll just say that that is the magnetic field. That's a little vector insignia above it. Now, what, what sort of particle could this be? I'm going to stop the video for a second because I'm going to go on up to the board. Particle here, this one's uh, a little bit easier. I'll just get rid of this. Can't see what colour I've got. There it is there. At this particle. Oops. Oh, yeah, all right. It's not going as well. What about this particle? We know, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, has a, it could have a smaller charge, couldn't it? Yes. What else could it have? Higher velocity, yes. What else could it have? Larger mass, yeah. Remember that uh, this one as well. What's a formula that you could say that shows uh, the, ra the radius compared to the mass? Remember this one? R equals MV on QB. Now, if the mass is larger, then the radius is larger also. And so um, I might have two positive particles. What do you think, considering what we've been talking about up here, what sort of particles are we talking about here? This one I'm going to say is a positron. What would this be? That would be my alpha particle. Having a larger mass, yes. It's a helium nucleus with two protons, yes. What about this particle? What about if I drew this? Yeah, we've got an electron, don't we? 
Beta negative particle. Very good. They get easier. Uh, what about this one? Oh, <laughs> you're already predicting it. You're looking in books, aren't you? Cheat. Uh, this one here, of course, is the gamma ray photon. Why, why doesn't the gamma ray photon see any deflections through that magnetic field? No charge. It has velocity. Doesn't have any charge, does it? It has no charge. It won't. It doesn't even see that magnetic field. Do you see the issue we have with finding these things, with understanding that they exist? If we can't see them and we have no detector that measures them or is affected by them, then we can't see them at all. Okay, so this is uh, some of the basis behind uh, the fact that we predict particles, but we can't see them. We have no machines that will tell us that they are there. Have I missed something here? Uh, no. So this is yes, mate. Yep. This is motion. Motion of ionizing radiation. in a magnetic field. Now what do I mean by ionizing radiation? I mean uh, I mean any one of these things, uh, positron, electron, alpha particle, gamma ray photon. Also ionizing radiation could be could be X rays, could be uh, UV rays. Now, why? Because, because basically they can break bonds in nuclei. They can, uh, sorry, they can break chemical bonds, not bonds in nuclei. Um, they, can, they can break chemical bonds. And if we have a long chain polymer, like uh, one called DNA, which we all have uh, lots of in our bodies, and we damage that in some way, it's chemistry, bad things can happen. They don't always happen, but they can happen. It's unlikely, in fact. The amount of molecules that they, these things come into contact with, uh, it's unlikely that they will damage the DNA, but it does happen. X-rays, you will all know uh, if you've if you've worn any, if you've been for an X-ray recently, you'll know that they they put usually uh, they're kind of a plastic heavy coat over you. The plastic has lead inside it, and it stops the X-rays from going in the uh, basically affecting your entire body. They only want it to affect. Um, a smaller, a small part of your body. Okay, a smaller part of, of your body as possible. Um, so, the right-hand palm rule. Will tell us. Ionizing radiation. Okay. How do you minimize your exposure? Any ideas? Okay, shielding, yes. Wear a coat. Wear a coat. Okay, yeah, you got to... All right, a coat's not going to do it, but a lead coat will. Well, actually, if you had... Like, this might stop some alpha particles, according to the text. If a sheet of paper will stop it, just put on a woolly jumper. Um... I'd wear a lead coat though, and we, we call that shielding. Why? Only, only if you lick it. Yeah, you don't want to, don't want to ingest that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, well, no, that's why they have them in the plastic sheaths. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Let. Yeah. Yeah, lead. Lead's not used in pencils anymore. Yeah. You could start a new craze and call them graphite pencils. You, you could. What else could you do? How do you minimise exposure from these things? So I've got some of this stuff. I've got a pile of this stuff. And it's throwing off more stuff. Ah, oh, who said run away? Yeah, run away. That's what they did in Chernobyl. That's what they were told to do, run away, and it was good advice. Um, if, if I bring out some, uh, some ionising uh, radiation isotopes at school, though, you don't have to run away. Some exposure is okay, and the, the types of, the types of uh, uh, sources that we have at school are not particularly nasty. They will affect you. I wouldn't walk around with them in your pocket all day. But um, as long as we minimise exposure, uh, in fact, I'm, it's, I still wonder why they haven't taken them off of us, considering they've taken all sorts of stuff that's not really terrible. Anyway, run away. So um, uh, there's a better way to say it. Yes, that's nice. Yeah, increase, increase the distance. from the source. Why does that work? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm standing here, and that's me and I move to here, yeah, that's right, yeah, exactly. If you can think about, okay, so I'll just remove me up there. And if you think about the fact that there's ionizing radiation coming off in all directions from this stuff, whatever it may be, and I look at a unit area, if I look at a unit area in here, I'm going to get hit by two things. If I look at that same unit area out here, and I've chosen a convenient one, but I'm not going to hit by any. I'm not going to be hit by any there, am I? So what happens is the further you are away, the, the, the lower the density of those particles that are going to go through you. Um, what else? Shielding. Increase your distance from the source. What's that, Lachlan? Oh, yeah, we're... Uh, actually, I haven't said that yet, have I? I don't know. What... Hang on. Oh, yeah, no, I'll say that in a second. It's not going to make any difference, you're right. doesn't matter what you do to it. You can hit it with a hammer. It won't matter. Now, uh, I can reduce... Whoop. Reduce the exposure time. Reduce the exposure time. So, essentially, don't, don't stand there for very long. That question has come up in the exams before. Half-life. Not the game, as somebody else said in the last class. What is half-life? That's the game. Yes, exactly. The time that it takes for half of the atoms in a radioactive substance
to decay. Okay, so I have another pile of stuff, whatever it may be. No, we're going to say it's plutonium. PU. Plutonium. It has. Plutonium is particularly nasty. If uh, for those fans of Back to the Future, you will know that that's the stuff that they put into the time machine to make it go through time. And it's particularly hard to come by. Okay, so yeah, this stuff, we don't, we don't just dig plutonium out of the ground. It doesn't work like uranium. You might start with some uranium, an isotope of uranium. If we, boys at the front, please getting like you guys are getting excited up there please don't um, if we fire a neutron in there into this uranium 238 it will cause this is called an artificial transmutation it'll cause it to whoops do this 239 uranium still what kind of uh, what's happened here well we've just put a neutron in there Okay, what about this? Then it decays. 239 Neptunian, yes. Neptunium, NP. What sort of decay is going on here between these two? This one. A. Theta minus. What's the atomic number of Neptunium? 93, is it? 93? You need that information. Are you making it up? 92, right. So what's happened here? A neutron has turned into a proton. Is that right? Neutron has turned into a proton, which means that we've got some excess charge and we've thrown excess positive charge in the nucleus now. We've got rid of some... Negative charge, yeah, that's right. So we might see this happening, this beta minus particle. That's uh, that's good. And this decays also. Plutonium. Uh, now I know that one's 94. So we've got another beta minus decay. to become plutonium. You guys don't need to know this. I just want you to I just want you to know what what's going on here and how this happens. We need to process. This is this is the bulk. This is 97% of the uranium that we dig out of the ground is U238. It's got some U235. U235 is the one that's good for fission. Uh, and um, but they need to increase that. And if you want to make weapons, you need some of this stuff, or you need a whole lot of the U-235. And so what they do is they need to process this. And it's not just anybody's backyard where you can get a neutron gun and fire it at, uh, at some uranium and this, these reactions occur. And you probably don't want to be anywhere near this stuff when this is happening, because of course we've got ionizing radiation coming off of it as well. Um, which is why the world is reasonably safe uh, from from rogue people getting hold of this, a lot of this stuff. They can get hold of some, but not, not a whole lot. Um, lucky for us. Let's make a bomb. Yeah, that's that's what they said in the other class. We could we could uh, we could build it and put it out in the oval. Do you know? You need this much. Exactly that much is enough as a sphere to make it an atomic bomb that will make that explosion that we're all familiar with. Okay, it's not very much at all. All you have to do, and what what they do is they actually they actually make them in two halves because there's something called a critical mass, and if they're if they're if they're separated, 
then the critical mass doesn't it doesn't matter if a neutron goes into it. Um, it's not critical mass. It, it's not that point at which um, uh, all of this will go off almost at once, almost instantaneously. So what they do in bombs is they, they have two halves and they smash the two together at the same time as firing a neutron in. It's over the critical mass. The thing goes boom. Uh, yeah, but I don't know the process exactly. Yeah, the, the hydrogen bomb's much more complicated, I believe. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, I read it about a long time ago. I can't remember. Let's have a look. We can have a look. <clears throat> if the internet's working. I might pause, I might pause the video because the... This, Okay, thank you for the sound effects. That's good. <laughs> That's not the sound they make. Uh, one, if I have an atom here, this is one single atom, what can I say about... And, and it's radioactive. It's, it's, a, it's a radioactive atom. What can I say about when it's going to decay? You can't say a lot, no. In fact, you can, yeah, one single atom. Even if you knew, even if you knew the half-life of the substance from which it's made. Yeah, that's right. So, so imagine that this is plutonium, and I think plutonium has a half-life of about two hundred forty thousand years. All I could say is that there's a good chance that the atom will decay in 240,000 years. It may not, though. Okay? It may or may not. I can say if I've got more of a substance, if I've got a bunch of it, and I can say that uh, uh, essentially over time, in, in 240,000 years, approximately half of it will decay. Okay? Just by the law of statistics, based on the fact that there are trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms just in even in that small amount of this sub substance here, okay? Yeah, that's right. So the question was in the in the last class, so, okay, so uh, does that mean that half again goes in another 240,000 years? Yeah, well, it's approximately that. And eventually what happens is you get down to such a small amount what happens when you get down to very, very, very small amounts of the stuff? <laughs> it's blown away by the wind. Uh, actually, plutonium is pretty heavy metal and probably oh, would have to be a very strong wind. Okay? <laughs> now, but, but you, could, you could say that statistically, over this amount of time, 240,000 years, yeah, however much of the substance you have today, in 240,000 years, you'll probably have half of that substance. Yeah, that's... It is, as far as we know, a, is, a, is a completely... random... process random oh shh. please one thing boys at the front again please thank you completely random process it is completely spontaneous you cannot say when it's going to decay and that's the uh, that's the idea if you want to look it up uh, Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat. Look it up. I'm not going to tell the story. You can look it up. Okay. He was in a he was in a box with a radioactive substance, and he is both alive and dead at the same time. 
He didn't actually do this. It's a it's a mind game. He didn't actually do this to his poor quantum physics. It, it happens and it doesn't happen exactly. Yeah, that's right. We'll just pause. Uh, I'll, I'll just say I won't. I won't go into it, Schrodinger. Schrodinger's cat. Look it up. Uh, I think he's got the two little. I can't think of the name of that thing there. Schrodinger's cat. Now, um, it makes. It will make. Absolutely no difference. If I heat, melt, hammer, put, uh, goes on, put under pressure. Uh, these substances uh, Z greater than or equal to 83 atomic number greater than or equal to 83 um, uh, decay is completely random Oh, that looks like one word. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, did I... I can never remember whether I... Properties of emissions... We've got beta plus decay in there, haven't we? Yes, we have. Good. There's something that I did miss. Um, and I'll talk about that later. That's okay. Let's go on to half-life because that's what we're talking about here. Here is a graph. The graph shows a substance and here's the number of atoms in that substance on the y-axis. N sub zero is the original number of atoms equals the original number of atoms. Or the, the atoms that haven't decayed. And here we have N0 on 2, N sub 0 on 2, of course, is half the atoms. If you have a look, half of the atoms have decayed here at this point here. If I draw a line across there to our graph and then down to the x-axis, what that shows is, uh, now this is time along the bottom here, half of the atoms have decayed at this point, that is its half-life, and what they're saying is that's one half-life at this point. Here, half of half of the atoms, or a quarter of the atoms have decayed at this point. Two half lives have passed. Okay, so it's an exponential curve that shows this. Now I've got a problem because I should have moved this before. Because when I do move this, they're going to stay there. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's harder. It's all right. I'll draw them again. Here's the half-life. Here 
is the half-life again. Two half-lives have passed at that point. If I continue to look at half-lives, there's three half-lives have passed. Um, so N, nought, N sub naught on two says half of the atoms have decayed. And here's, uh, now, do we say up here, sorry, okay, so we did, half-life is the time it takes for half of the number of atoms to decay in a substance, in a, in a mass of some substance. Um, let's see, okay, so... For example, example that the book gives us, if we have twelve grams of something, something radioactive, after one half life uh, actually I'll say one and I'll change the insignia T sub half after one half life we have six grams now that's not to be mistaken like the other half of the stuff has just disappeared you would find that the masses are very similar if not exactly the same except we We've got we've got only six grams of the original substance and six grams of a another substance now, okay. After two half lives, two times t sub half, we have three grams, and so on. This is equal to half of the original substance and this is equal to one quarter of the original substance. Ah, so you're coming up with a formula there, Jacob? Yes. Yeah, N naught. Huh? Yeah, N naught on 2 to the power of N. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, so the number of atoms, and, and this is which equals the number of atoms left. left to decay um, and where where n is equal to the half life One more thing and then I've got a problem for you. Oh, I might solve this problem, but I'll get you to do the second one. Activity uh, This is
the number of nuclei that decay per unit time. And if we're talking in seconds, then we mean becquerels. BQ is the insignia. Uh, uh, sorry, spelt B E C Q U E R E L, I think. Becquerels. Yes. Becquerel. Can you see that activity is related to uh, the the half life or the number of atoms that are decaying, essentially? Because if I have if I have some substance and it throws off a particle, then I would read that as activity, wouldn't I? But I could also say that this is n naught minus one, so they are related. Let's do a problem. I think we can fit this one in here. Uh, yeah, maybe, yep. I think there's enough room. I'll do it next to it. That's all right. So... I know there's no table there yet. Table below records the count rate for a radioactive source. Plot a graph uh, of count rate against time. Find the half-life of the source and determine the expected activity after six half-lives. Now, that's easy enough. You might have to, you're going to have to draw a graph, firstly. And they tell you what to do here, so draw a graph. On the y-axis, I'm going to have counts per second or activity. Uh, and it's in seconds per second. And time on the y, uh, on the x-axis, time here in minutes. And then we have, so there's 100, there's 50, there's 75, and there's 25. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 25, 50, 75, 100 up there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If I plot these... Plot them in uh, orange. Of course, after zero time has passed, we start with our 100 units of this stuff. After one minute, 59 are left. It's around about there. Two minutes, 34 are left. Around about there. Three minutes, 20. Round about there. Four minutes, 12. Round about there. Five minutes, seven. There somewhere. Now I'm going to try and draw this curve. It's not that easy. Oh, no, I can't. Now, if you guys draw graphs like this, I'll be very upset. Okay. Now, this is what is called an exponential curve. What do we know about exponential curves?
what what I was interested in is more simply that, that theoretically they never actually reach zero. They never actually go to zero. And that's because when we're talking about this stuff up here, um, there's so many of those atoms that uh, in our realm, it never really does reach zero. It's always emitting something. Now, of course, you can see as, as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, its activity gets lower and lower and lower. And you might, if this was plutonium, and you were down to the last atom to decay, you might find that uh, that atom takes 240,000 years or even more to decay. All right. Uh, how do I find the half-life? That's not so hard. We were doing that before. I'll draw it in yellow. Uh, so we started with 100. We left with 50. That's about there. I see that as uh, about 1.2 minutes from the graph. I'm going to do it in yellow. Oh. White, sorry. Uh, T sub half, half life equals one point two minutes. Um, what about six half lives? What do you do? Let's use our original formula. We'll give us a number of atoms left after, if I put a 6 in there and I put our original number in there, 100 on 2 to the power of 6, which equals, we did this calculation, 100 on 64, which is equal to 1.56 becquerels um, would, would be the activity after six half-lives. This is activity after six half lives so the question is example 2 shh, please tv160 uh i think it, that's the uh, atomic number 65 decays via beta minus decay with a half life of 73 days in a given sample there are 4 by 10 to the 18 atoms of tv160 Write an equation for this decay, firstly, and determine the number of turbium-160 nuclei remaining after one year, or 365 days. Uh, and I'll read out the next example in a second, uh, or after you've done this one, after you've had a go. Yes? Okay, so turbium TB-160 65 Decays. Now, if you don't know what it is, that's okay. Just call it X. That's what the book does, and that would be sufficient. They would tell you, though, in the exam, they wouldn't, because people would be quite uh, concerned about this. So, um, we know that it decays via beta minus decay. So, I can put this minus one, zero here. Plus what? All right, some gamma plus anti-neutrino, yes. So what's this going to be? 65, 66, 160. 66 minus 1. Our conservation of charge holds there. That's a good good equation for that one. Uh, 365 days. One thing, shh, please. One thing I also noticed is these numbers here correspond to very easy calculations in the end. Is equal exactly to five half-lives. 
How convenient. Half lives. There's four by ten to the eighteen atoms. Okay, so four point zero by ten to the power of eighteen over two to the power of five. Equals 1.25 by 10 to the 17. Nuclei remaining. We might finish that next lesson. You guys can relax now because it's, um, I know it's Friday. Hang on, how big is this question? Oh, we've got to draw a graph. We'll do that next lesson. That's